It's a pleasure to have our author, Dr. Michael Maccabee, president of the Maccabee Group, to speak to us about leadership and change. I can say that recently I looked at um, all of your websites again, and I was considering um, you know, when the executive directors and presidents and chief CEOs came uh, to their positions, and it's pretty surprising that in a network of 95 councils, Roughly a third have been in their leadership roles for two years or less. Some of that, of course, is due to volunteer uh, board presidents rotating off on uh, being, you know, fulfilling their term limits. But still, uh, for many councils, it amounts to tremendous change, transition, and stress points in trying to keep momentum going, and that's why we do these, we, we do these talks. Dr. Maccabee has advised global companies, universities, nonprofit organizations, institutions like the World Bank and the State Department over a 40-year career. He's taught at Oxford Side School of Business, at Harvard, um, where he has his degrees. And um, in addition to his new book, which I hope you will purchase and learn from, it's called Strategic Intelligence, Conceptual Tools for Leading Change, which came out this summer in the UK and in the US. There are copies back there, and, and you'll be able to purchase it and have him sign it. He's also written a number of other books, including one that we were speaking about today, uh, called Narcissistic Leaders, Those Who Succeed and Those Who Fail. Um, some of our presidential candidates fit right into that, so he's getting a lot of extra notice uh, for that, but um, um, maybe maybe some of us fall into that trap. I don't know. Um, as long as we succeed, he's he's going to study it and tell us how we're doing. Dr. Maccabee, it's a pleasure to have you here addressing the World Affairs Councils of America Leadership Day. Thank you so much. And the question period, I would, I might need some help because I don't hear very well. So. I'll be here for you. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Bill, and I hope these things aren't... Uh, you're, you're wired. All right. You hear me well enough? Uh, I appreciate very much being invited, and... Uh, I hope that I can help you understand uh, what kind of leadership is needed, how to develop it. Uh, and uh, one of the things uh, in the book that I just wrote, it's not just my experience and theory, but all, it's also a workbook with a lot of uh, exercises in your personal development as a leader. But today, I'd like to uh, talk about four questions. Number one, what is leadership versus management? It's very interesting with all kinds of programs of leadership. Uh, it's often not even defined, so we don't even know what we're trying to create. Um, second of all, and also, how does it differ from management? Second of all, why is it so difficult today to be an effective leader? Because it is, as we'll see. Three, can leadership really be taught? What are the results of all the leadership programs? There are billions of dollars today spent in the United States on leadership programs. What are the results? Can leadership really be taught? And fourth, what are the qualities of global leaders who are effective? What are the qualities they need, and how can they be developed? First of all, I think there are many, many definitions given of leadership and a leader, literally hundreds, and uh, a lot of argument what it is. And I think one of, the one of the problems is 
that there are two factors that people don't take into account. Number one, there is a confusion often between uh, what is good leadership in terms of effective versus moral. So in other words, you can say, if you want to talk about a good leader from a moral point of view, you talk about somebody like Abraham Lincoln or Nelson Mandela. But if you want to talk about a, a good leader from an effective point of view, you'd have to probably include Hitler. So that's the first problem. You've got to be clear what you mean by a good leader. Second of all, there are in fact different kinds of leaders, not one type of leader. As we'll see, that's one of the problems of a lot of leadership training. They don't, and leadership always implies a context. Somebody could be a uh, good leader in one context, effective, and in another context, they're not. A good example is Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was the indispensable leader of Britain in World War II, but rejected by the British public both before and after the war. Same qualities, same abilities. And yet, at one point, he's a great leader, and then other two points, he's not a leader at all. Why? Well, because the British public's attitudes changed. What they wanted changed. They wanted, uh, before the war, Churchill saw the threat of Germany and he wanted to rearm, rearm Britain and the British public believed peace in our time and they saw him as a warmonger. After the war, uh, Churchill still believed in the British Empire. He was an aristocrat. The British public were becoming socialistic. They didn't want the burden of empire and they rejected him. But it could go on. You could see, you can see it also in businesses, you can see people who are very good at developing a company, but once the company is large, they're, they're not able to deal it anymore. Jerry Yang of Yahoo is a perfect example of that. There are many examples of it. So leadership always requires thinking in terms of a context, and as also we'll see different kinds of leaders. Now, if I look at many of the definitions that are given, they don't really hold. Uh, Warren Bennis, who's a very famous leadership guru, said a leader is someone with a vision who is able to realize it. Well, isn't that true of a gardener? Carpenter? I mean, uh, uh, Bill Gates said leaders are those who empower people. But we've had terrible leaders who've disempowered people. Stalin wasn't a leader. Of course he was a leader, but he didn't empower people. Or he empowered only those who were part of his gang. So uh, Eisenhower had a very good uh, description of what a good leader uh, may do. He said the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because he wants to he wants to do it, not because you tell him. I mean, that's true of a good leader, but it's not a definition. The only good definition that I've come across is a leader is someone with followers. Sounds simple, but it's not so simple. If you have followers, you are a leader. And if you don't have followers, if you could be president of the United States, if nobody's following you, you're not a leader. So the first point, a leader has followers. The interesting question is, why does somebody follow you? How do they follow you? What we want today are leaders who can get people to collaborate with them, not out of fear, but out of conviction, to work together for the common good. That's the kind of leader we need. But uh, there, are, there are different reasons why People follow a leader. So leadership is a relationship in a context. If people follow you, 
You can't give your leadership away to someone else. Management, on the other hand, has to do with processes and so on that you can give away. I've worked with organizations where teams of workers do all the management. There's a GE factory in North Carolina that makes engines for Boeing. All, all of the management, hiring, evaluating, budgeting is done by teams of workers. The manager of the factory, her job is really marketing with Boeing. So management, management has to do with processes. Management can be given away, but leadership is a relationship in a context. Now, today, we desperately need leaders. We need leaders who can get people working together for the common good. As we can see, a lack of this kind of leadership all over. People going their own ways, not working together. So why is leadership so difficult? I mean, take a look at um, uh, the surveys done by the Kennedy School at Harvard show 80% of Americans do not trust their leaders. Whether it's government leaders or leaders in business, the highest level of trust is the military. If we look at uh, heads of state, Obama's ratings around 40, 45%. That's the same as Cam, uh, Cam, Cameron of Britain. Um, Angela Merkel was higher. She was up in the 70s and 80s until she decided to take in refugees in Germany and her ratings had fallen about 20%. The only head of state I can see who has a very high rating is Putin. But I ask you, suppose you were living in Moscow and somebody knocked on the door and said, do you support President Putin? What would you say? So I take that, I take that with a grain of salt. Now if we look from, from a point of view of history, if we go back to, uh, from an anthropological point of view, if we go back to hunter-gatherer tribes, they only, they only chose leaders for a particular process, a hunting party, a war party. But once that was over, um, if somebody tried to stay a leader, they were ostracized. People didn't want leaders. Early pe people didn't want leaders. leaders later imposed themselves. In peasant villages, well, some of the first work I did in Mexico, studying peasants. And peasants don't want leaders. They're very independent. Their family is important. Uh, leaders are looked at as exploitative. People are going to come in and, and use you for some purpose. Uh, in Mexico, they hired Emiliano Zapata to defend them during the Mexican Revolution, but that, that was just for a purpose, just like the hunter-gatherers. The reason we need leaders today is because of the complexity. So that you're, we are in a period of constant change, constant threat, and we're not going to have positive response. We're not going to have a creative development without leadership. Leadership which has, as I'll say more about, a clear philosophy that people can sign on to and support. Furthermore, um, having worked in 36 countries, I can tell you there are real differences in leadership models in different countries that I've worked in. I mean, even the difference between um, Taipei and Beijing. Taipei still on a kind of uh, uh, Confucian model of the leader as a father figure, who loyal, supportive. Beijing went through a cultural revolution um, where, where the whole family was attacked. And when I asked uh, 
I asked technical people in Beijing, what's your idea of a good leader? They said it's like a good basketball coach, knows where to put people, um, knows good strategy, can change it. Um, but everywhere, if I t take, for example, the difference between working in Germany and Sweden. In Sweden, everybody uh, believes in avoiding conflict, having consensus. Uh, the Germans consider the Swedes a lack integrity. They don't, because they won't, they won't bring out their differences and fight for them. In Germany, they, they encourage uh, creative conflict, opposition, bring in the facts, let's work it through. But once, once they come to a decision, they all march together. The Swedes often agree consensually, and when the meeting's over, they go out in the car park and say what they really think. <laughs> so we have to, if we're talking about global leadership, another difficulty is really understanding culture and understanding people. And even in our own society, I'll come to that more, we're seeing a change in the social character of people at work, change in attitudes, change in values. I've seen over a uh, whole period that I've been working. Um, now, if you think about it, people who were brought up in, uh, if you go back to the 1950s or 60s, um, how many people in this room came from families where the father was the single wage earner in the family? How many live in families like that right now? See the difference? The whole experience of growing up has changed with a whole dramatic transformation in the role of women in society. So that if you go back, children brought up in what I call the bureaucratic age, um, they saw the father working as, uh, as the work, worker representing workplace, mother representing the family, and so on. Today, children are brought up with, there are actually more families in America today headed by a single woman than there are those traditional families that so many of you grew up in. So, and, and we're seeing a whole different attitude rather than, rather than uh, the bureaucratic attitude of trying to move up the ladder uh, and being, um, trying to be like the father figure running the company. We're seeing kids brought up today much more with, with peer relationships, much more independent, looking at work often. Uh, I, I noticed here one of your sponsors is Google. When I, I gave a talk at Google a while ago, and I had lunch with a bunch of young Google people, I said, how many, how many of you expect to be in this company in five years from now? Zero. They saw, they saw work at Google as postgraduate experience postgraduate experience. They wanted to go to a nonprofit, be an entrepreneur, etc. We've seen a huge dramatic change that makes leadership much more difficult. Kids are growing up in families where they see their parents not as disciplinarians, but as service providers. <laughs> and when they get to work, what do they want from their managers? What are you doing for me? So we're seeing a real diversity is not only diversity in, in sex or race or so on, it's also diversity in personality that can be even more difficult uh, when you're trying to lead an organization with different people with very different attitudes to leadership and authority. Can leadership be taught? Well, first of all, all the research shows dismal results from all the billions spent on leadership. McKinsey did a study recently uh, where two thirds of the CEOs interviewed said that not only was leadership training worthless, it was often destructive. <clears throat> the 
People were trained in ways which didn't fit the reality of where they were going. There's a new book out by Jeffrey Pfeffer, a professor at Stanford, called Leadership BS. And, and what he, he points out how, how so much of leadership training gives inspirational talks and so on that are hot, not, totally irrelevant to the kind of world that people are going into and what it takes to work, particularly when you're dealing with people who are often resistant, often have purposes of their own, et cetera. So why, why do leadership development programs fail? Well, McKinsey says they overlook context, which I've been talking about, differences in culture and mode of production, they're decoupled from real work, and they underestimate the mindsets of the people who they're going to be leading. They, they act as though the, people are just going to follow if you're nice and have emotional intelligence and listen and so on. And actually, research shows that nice, kindly leaders with emotional intelligence, the employees do not work better. As a matter of fact, they often work less well because uh, the boss is so nice and kind that they can get away with anything. So uh, uh, there is what the McKinsey study shows is a lack of realism. I would go further. One thing I've seen working in organizations today, we shouldn't talk about a leader. It's a leadership team. We, it's not just one person. Think about, think about the, uh, uh, the history of Apple. Steve Jobs, when he first was CEO of Apple, tried to run everything by himself. Tried to be, and, and, he, and he was terrible dealing with people. Brilliant strategist, thinker, marketer, terrible with people. And he was fired. He learned that he needed to partner. Brought in Tim Cook as an operational leader, brought in Joni Ives as a design leader, created a leadership team, which of course has been incredibly successful. And I've seen it time again. We need to talk about a leadership team, not just a leader. It's one thing that's lacking. Second of all, the importance of a leadership philosophy. All the great organizations I've worked with, leaders have had a clear philosophy. First learned this, I interviewed Bill Hewlett, Hewlett Packard, back in the 70s. I said, Bill, what's the purpose of HP? He said, the purpose of HP is to make products that help technical people do their job better. He didn't say to make money. He didn't say to make profit. Help people do their job better with our products. And how do you do that, Bill? Well, first of all, we have to have excellence in all of our people. Therefore, we'll pay for anyone who wants to go back to Stanford Engineering School and get up on the latest uh, knowledge. Second of all, collaboration, starting, starting with the customer. We have people developing our products go out to the customers, learn what they want, come back to Palo Alto, develop a team with manufacturing and marketing, working collaboratively. Third. Loyalty. We don't lay anybody off. If we have a downturn in business, everyone takes a cut of 20% and one day off a week, starting with me. And fourth, we want innovation. We want entrepreneurs. We want people who are going to create new ideas. I said, Bill, but if you have entrepreneurs here, aren't they going to leave? He said, of course. But because we treated them so well, they're going to be our customers and our suppliers. That was the beginning of Silicon Valley. Apple came out of there, others came out of there, of a powerful philosophy that was later lost. Mayo Clinic, William Mayo had a powerful philosophy. Patient comes first, but <clears throat> collaborative medicine, research for patient 
benefits, etc. Tim Cook said, recently he was interviewed about Steve Jobs, he said, Steve was the best flipper in the world, and it's because he didn't get married in any one position, any one view. He was married to the philosophy, to the values. I don't know people teaching that to leadership, but um, I mean, I could go on in my book. I have a whole chapter on the importance of philosophy, not only for leadership, but also for our individual development. A developed personality is a personality that has developed a, a philosophy of life, a purpose, a sense of values that people can count on, trust, understand. Finally, um, too many of these training programs give people roadmaps, uh, which really don't work in many situations. Change, for example, rather than developing the qualities of mind and heart that allow you to create your own roadmap, your own, your own ideas of how to change and how to develop. I would say, there's another thing I've observed. A lot of people go into leadership training who really don't want to be leaders. I remember a friend of mine at MIT. He said, you know, I like working with the hardware and the software. I don't like working with the wetware. <laughs> there are a lot of people who go to these programs because they want a diploma, they want to punch a card, they want to get promoted. They really don't want to work with people. They don't want to do what leaders need to do. I would say my experience is you can, you can uh, develop leadership, but people have to have three qualities if, if they're going to be developed as leaders. One is purpose. Two is passion about that purpose, the willingness to really stand up for what you believe in. And third, which is extremely important, is courage. Samuel Johnson wrote, courage is perhaps the greatest of all the qualities, because if you don't have courage, you may not be able to use any of the others. If you have, if you have passion, Purpose, passion, and courage, you can develop leadership. If you don't, it's not going to be worth very much to go through a leadership program so that you, it'd be, it might be nice, you might learn some techniques, listen to people, understand yourself, all these things. It's not going to make you a leader. What I have found, um, Bill mentioned work I did on narcissistic leaders. Actually, I was working with a, a very creative narcissistic leader who, uh, who was a great strategist, a really brilliant strategist. But his vice presidents really didn't seem to understand strategy. They all. Uh, when, when they had a challenge that really required strategy, they just wanted to uh, improve productivity, cut costs. It's all operational. By the way, uh, 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 the Gallup organization has done a lot of studies of strengths in the federal government. And they find the, the lowest level of strength is strategy. Uh, even people at level like the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they, they come in and they really don't know what they're supposed to do. They wish they were back commanding a division where they knew what, what they were doing. Working with this, with this incredible creative narcissist, um, I started to interview him of how he thought. And what, I, what came out of it were certain qualities 
of leadership that I have found essential for strategic leadership. It may not be in one person, it might be in the whole team, but it includes foresight, sense of what, what's changing, what are the threats, what are the opportunities. Two, visioning. How do you turn that knowledge into a vision of what the organization should be? And in the book, I, I, I write about what I've learned from great thinkers about developing a vision of an organization. W. Edwards Deming I worked with for a number of years, and Russell Acoff at the Wharton School, great thinker on systems thinking, which is crucial to understanding how to create a vision of an organization. Third, partnering. I heard in some of your discussion talking about partnering. Partnering becomes more and more crucial. Not only partnering uh, in your organization, being able to pick the right people to work with. And by the way, if you don't have a philosophy, it's much harder to know who you can work with, who shares your philosophy, who shares your purpose and values. A lot of People in leadership roles get into big trouble picking partners, just like a lot of people get into big trouble picking marriage partners, because they don't, they don't start out with a clear philosophy and understand uh, that they need to work with people who share, essentially, that philosophy. Also, <clears throat> partnering with other organizations becomes more and more essential or all organizations. And finally, engaging and motivating people to realize that vision. <clears throat> and that's not so easy. The Gallup study shows only 30% of employees in the United States are engaged in their work. And the percentage is lower in other, in other countries. And I've uh, written a lot in the book about how to engage and why people don't engage. Because they're not engaged in their intrinsic motivation. I mean, we're all motivated. Nobody has to engage us to play a game we like. Nobody has to motivate us. Um, nobody has to motivate me to play with my grandchildren. Um, but. We are, not, we are not looking at what it means to engage intrinsic motivation. And again, that comes back also to a philosophy, to understanding, and to understanding people. And understanding people um, is really a huge lack in our teaching and our understanding. And it's a matter of both uh, cognitive, intellectual understanding, people's motivational systems, drives, uh, but it's also a matter of the heart. People talk about emotional intelligence, but I, I prefer to talk about developing the heart. In, in the Old Testament, in the story of King Solomon, Solomon has a dream, and in the dream, um, God comes and asks what he can give him, and Solomon says, a heart that listens. And that, the Bible says, is the basis of his knowledge. And to understand people, I can understand intellectually what motivates people in terms of type of job and role and so on. But to understand people's feelings of anger, happiness, hope, despair, it's a matter of a heart, developing the heart. And in the book we discuss what are the exercises to develop the heart as well as the head in terms of understanding people. Well, let me conclude. We obviously need leaders today to improve quality of life, population health, human and economic development. We need leaders who are going to move people from a narrow views of self-interest and tribalism to collaboration and, and, uh, and carrying across boundaries. And uh, 
what I hope, what I've tried to do in the work in this book and strategic intelligence is to help those who aspire to be these kinds of leaders to develop this kind of capability. And let me just end by a, a quote from Woodrow Wilson about political leadership. Now in this time where we're having all these debates, Wilson wrote, an essential quality of political leadership is profound sympathy with those whom he leads. A sympathy which is insight, an insight which is from the heart rather than the intellect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Maccabee. Uh, I think we had a very well-organized, well-presented discourse on things that we grapple with every day. I'm glad you emphasized having the heart as well as the head, not to mention the guts, to persevere through some very difficult times with lack of resources, exceedingly demanding stakeholders, and the general flow of business day to day in this country and in the world. We deal with that. We are, we are passionate about trying to create a wider audience that's more engaged with international affairs and opportunities, that's lucid, that's clear, that's making good decisions. So I invite this audience to, to, to ask questions of Dr. McAbee. We have about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we can also do the book thing. Patrick, who gave a great presentation, I'll start with you. Hi, thank, thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, can you elaborate a little more on the culturally, uh, the leaders in different cultural contexts and what might be different um, from one country to the other? The question is about leaders in different cultural contexts. What about the differences between those leaders? And it, as more people manage multicultural teams, what does one need to be successful? Thank you. And how to be successful managing multicultural teams? It's not easy. Uh, I was thinking about when I was working in Finland, uh, they asked me, uh, they said, if you really want to understand leadership here, you should read a book called The Unknown Soldier. And this book describes two military leaders in the Finnish-Russian War. And uh, one is very arrogant and, and uh, gives orders and so on. And nobody likes him, nobody follows him. The other is working right with the people down in the trenches, being one of the people and everybody follows. Now, so the, the Finnish leadership is very strongly um, not, not acting uh, arrogant, not, not getting above people and so on. But I mean, that, that's not the kind of leadership in this country. Um, and as I pointed out, the difference in leadership even within uh, Chinese speaking people of Singapore and Taiwan versus mainland China. So I think the first thing, if you're going to work with these types of people, you have to understand the kind of leadership they're coming from. And uh, you have to engage them in, uh, in the developing a common sense of purpose and philosophy. And that a, a powerful culture trumps these national differences, particularly when you're sensitive to the people. When I was in Thailand, one of the first uh, Asian countries I, I went to was Thailand. And I was very skeptical of whether people would be open to me. And uh, I was, I was interviewing some technical people, and they were very open, and they told me things that, that in confidence that were very personal and so on. And I said to one of them, you know, I'm really surprised. What, people told me you were not going to be open to, to some Westerner. Why are you so open? And he, he said to me, because it was clear 
you really wanted to understand. I had come, I had studied how important Buddhism was in Thailand, how important the, the role of the king was. I was trying to learn, and people understood that. And I've seen that with other effective global leaders. People can recognize the difference between wanting to understand them versus just talking at them. Lisa, identify yourself. Thank you for a great talk. My name is Lisa Falsko. I'm with the Alaska World Affairs Council. And I have a question for you in regards to developing leaders. In your philosophy, would you say it's important to help them increase their strengths or work on their weaknesses? Oh, is that? So in developing leaders, do you focus more on increasing and working with their strengths or fixing their weaknesses, correct? The faster route to developing a leader. You know, I think of the song by Johnny Mercer, accentuate the positive, yeah. eliminate the negative, don't mess with Mr. In-Between. <laughs> I think you have to, be, I think you have to um, build on people's strengths, but there are different kinds of weaknesses. One kind of weaknesses is when people overdo their strengths. I mean, somebody who's caring may be smothering. They have to see that strengths can be overdone. Um, but there's another kind of weakness which is more difficult, where people are, um, let's say, addicted to some kind of drive in a negative versus a positive way. Like, like people are overly controlling, micromanaging. And they need to really be able to frustrate that and put more energy in the positive. But you can't get rid of the negative unless you can emphasize the positive. Let's go back to Anna. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Anna Lambertson. I'm director of the International Relations Council in Kansas City, Missouri. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, my question is, so you talk about having the heart and we have to have the guts and I think we have all of that back in Kansas City. We also have to pay staff and rent and all these other um, more lucrative um, things. So in, in your book you talk about how we can motivate others through purpose. Um, can you speak about how we can motivate our board and other individuals charged with fundraising for the organization to be motivated and seek financial support for the organization in a way that's effective? Oh, okay. Great. So the question is about how to motivate others, specifically how to motivate a nonprofit board to work for the organization, particularly in the area of fundraising. Good question. Um, I've seen, as I examine all the theories of motivation, there are two types, hard motivation and soft motivation. Hard motivation is the carrots and sticks, rewards, punishment, and that doesn't really motivate anyone who is uh, working as a volunteer or somebody in any profession. I mean, you know, no, no teacher teaches better because you're going to give her more money. Uh, or no doctor will treat you better. If you pay more, I wouldn't go to such a doctor. And the soft motivation, as I pointed out, often doesn't work either, of caring and so on. So what I've come to is what I call smart motivation. And that includes what, the, what I call the five R's. And uh, these are tools that you can use to motivate, engage, engage people, particularly when you understand what their intrinsic motivation is, which you can ask about. The five R's are, one, reasons. People are motivated because something makes, inspires them. 
I've worked for 50 years uh, with a home, orphan, home for orphans and abandoned children. Started out in Mexico, it's now in nine countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Five of those countries are now, are organizations headed by orphans who grew up in the organization. Our executive director was a orphan who grew up in the organization. And uh, I'm motivated by that because I really find it very, very positive, rewarding to see these kids grow up into wonderful people who will come from homes of, of, of destitution and violence. So one is reasons. Number two are responsibilities. People are motivated if you put them in roles that connect with their competence. In other words, if somebody, somebody really uh, loves solving problems, you put them in that kind of role. If somebody really wants to take care, care for people, you find that kind of role. So you have to know where, what responsibility. We are motivated when we're doing things that really engage our confidence and our values. Third, recognition. Don't underestimate recognition. You've got to constantly recognize people who contribute to the organization. Um, you may feel you're not recognized enough. I'm sure that's true. But everyone feels the same way. And everyone wants, everyone wants to be recognized for, for what we contribute and what we do. Fourth, rewards. And rewards don't have to just be money. We know rewards can be uh, rec partly recognition, appreciation, partly having uh, the ability to come to meetings like this. Um, there are different kinds of rewards, new learnings, people that I met at Google, the rewards for them were learning new things, having new experiences and so on that they could bring out and, and, and start their own companies, etc. And five, fifth, which is essential, are relationships. Relationships for many people are the crucial thing, that they, they really have warm, collaborative relationships. They're turned off when relationships are, are not satisfied. More people leave companies, uh, talented people, because they don't like their boss than any other single reason. So let me ask you right here, think, rank order the five R's. Let me ask all of you to rank, rank them order. order. Reasons, responsibilities, recognition, rewards, relationships. What, what are those five most motivate you? Pick two. Okay, how many would say reasons? Lots. How many would say responsibilities? Some. Recognition. Rewards. Relationships. Oh, everybody. So, that's something to work with. And you can do that same little exercise with everyone in your organization. And then ask them, how well are we really doing this? Where are the gaps? What can we do to close them? Uh, Diana. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. That was such a wonderful talk. Uh, Diane Conroy Lasavita from the International Center of the Capital Region, Albany, New York. Uh, my question deals with the differential between men and women, different leadership styles. And I ask this, oftentimes you're placed in a position where they ask you to lead, and sometimes you might get pushback. And I think oftentimes it might be based upon your sex as compared to necessarily your ability. What's the question? The question has to do with differences in leadership uh, between men and women, and the, the y yes? 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 Differences in leadership between men and women, and how some respond to pushback, yeah, give an example. 
I was asked to run a committee for a local municipality where I do not live. And I said, okay. So I did it, and it actually, the committee went very well. Gentleman on the committee introduced me to a colleague, and he said, I'd like to introduce you to Diane. She is the most aggressive woman I've ever met in my life. <laughs> gentleman looked at me, looked at this other gentleman, and he said, do you mean assertive? And so that's my question, is sometimes I, I think as a female, you're placed in positions of leadership, not something you ask for, and you get this pushback, and so when you lead. Okay, so Diane was asked to run a committee in a community where she didn't live, and someone introduced her and described her as being aggressive, and she said, don't you mean assertive? Another, another person said, don't you mean assertive? And this goes to the heart of perhaps perception, perceptions of her as a woman and, 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 and the way we might expect people to exercise leadership based on our gender. It's complicated. <laughs> The problem I've seen has more to do with how people view women in leadership roles. Leadership tends to provoke uh, what psychoanalysis calls transference. People transfer onto the leader, often attitudes from childhood, of parents. And it's one thing to look at a, a good versus bad father. But with, with women, it's much more complicated. Eric Fromm, who I worked with, once said, there, there are two kinds of men. Uh, one kind um, knows he's afraid of women, and the other type of man doesn't know it. <laughs> but very often, people transform, trans for on to women, either the image of a fairy godmother or the wicked witch. And uh, they, I remember talking to one woman CEO who I work closely with. She said, people expect me to be their mother. And I have to tell them, look, I'm not your mother. I, I might be your friend. Um, so nobody expects. Well, a few people expect the men to be motherly, but that's much rarer. I think one of the, uh, uh, Angela Merkel, for example, has been able to take the role of the great mother. They call her Mutti uh, in Germany. That she is a, 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 a strong mother figure. But, um, I mean, every woman doesn't want to be a mother figure like that. And, uh, and so, uh, you've got to, we, the best way to deal with that is to begin to more understand personalities and get away from these uh, childhood images. That said, Diane is the most assertive fairy godmother I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mac, and we'll go over here next, Mac. It's Mac Pope, Peoria Area World Affairs Council, and thank you for this uh, a very deep and good conversation. Question is, um, how do you feel, or how do you think um, technology has changed leadership? I used to worry in the middle 90s, 1990s, when we all became mobile, and how leadership would play out when most leadership previously had been done in person, or at least, you know, a small part on the phone. But also now we have our younger, you know, our, our YPOs responding mainly through technology as well. But how does technology affect leadership versus 20 years ago? The question from Mac Pogue of the Peoria Area World Affairs Council is, how has technology changed leadership versus 20 years ago? For example, with people's mobility, communication devices, and so forth. Well, it's a mixed bag. 
because you can get, obviously, you can get information out very quickly. However, you could also get bad information out very quickly. Um, I worked with one CEO who said, if you have a problem with somebody, don't put it on the internet. Don't put it on email. Call them up. Talk to them directly. If you want to say something good about someone, then put it on the internet. People can see it. Um, I think uh, sometimes as I look at the uh, new generations brought up with all the social technology, I sometimes think it's the most connected generation in history and the least related. So I think there is no, there's no substitute for direct human relationships. And uh, I think the danger is that we don't look at technology as a tool, but as a solution. Excellent. Cole? I'm the president of the World Affairs Council, Greater Miami. Uh, I want to thank you for coming here today, but also thank you for my signed book. Hope other people get it. Um, my question really has to do with um, with ethics uh, and uh, leadership. Uh, I'm a retired military. I had the great privilege to serve with a lot of uh, tremendous um, uh, officers and enlisted along my career. Uh, one of my classmates uh, just retired, uh, uh, Ray Lordiano, uh, is the chief of staff of the Army. And I remember in his remarks, uh, he talked about taking care of people, but he also talked about the ethical side, doing the right thing. So my question is, when you're faced with a situation in leadership, when uh, sometimes, and I, th I see this all the time, where people take the, the route where they can get away with it, where they can get money out, more money out of it, knowing that you know, in the long run it's not going to make a difference, but it's the wrong thing to do. How do you work with people on that and convince them that really part of leadership is doing the right thing? Okay, the question is about ethics. And he cited a, a retired military uh, general. Was he general? Yeah, Ray Ordiorno. Uh, taking care of people and doing the right thing were two of his his touch points, but when you're confronted with uh, cutting corners, operating in difficult situations, trying to get money only, how do you convince those kind of people who might shortcut ethics to work to do work with people to do the right thing? Well, I, I don't think it, it doesn't start with a situation. It starts with building a culture and. Uh, one of the elements in a leadership philosophy is how do we make ethical and moral decisions here. And uh, ethics, I, I see a difference between ethics and moral reasoning. Ethics is like the Ten Commandments. Uh, I mean, you, you, better, you better do the right thing or you're going to get into trouble. So you want an ethical organization to begin with. But moral reasoning gets into some of the issues that you're talking about. And there are three levels of moral reasoning uh, that I find in different organizations. The lowest level is I do whatever I can get away with. And you find that a lot of places. That's the lowest level of moral reasoning. The second level is we do what's good for our company. We do what's good for our family. This is a kind of tribal morality. And uh, that's very common. I mean, so, sometimes companies have a hard time going from the lowest even to that. And the third level is we make decisions on the basis of what is good for all our people, our customers, our clients, the environment, all the things that we interact with. And a few organizations are trying to move to that level. However, any philosophy to be practiced has to have a kind of, of 
pragmatic uh, approach to values, a principled pragmatism. Let me give you an example of that. During the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, great leader with a clear philosophy, had a purpose, two purposes. One was to keep the Union together, and the other was to end slavery, which he saw as a great evil, made clear. During the beginnings of the war, General Fremont wanted to free the slaves in Missouri, and Lincoln fired him, refused to do it. People thought, oh, he's really not, doesn't have the value. But Lincoln made clear, if he freed the slaves at that early point in the Civil War, he would lose the border states, he would lose the war, and the Confederacy would be able to, to uh, increase slavery throughout the West. When he was able, during the war, to show that the slaves were actually helping militarily to the South, he could then make the Emancipation Proclamation and free the slaves. It wasn't that Lincoln didn't hold to his values, he was a, but he had to be a pragmatist. You have to look at your purpose constantly whenever you're making these decisions. Are your decisions really furthering your purpose and your values in the long run? Very good. I think uh, we've been keeping Dr. McAbee standing quite a long time. I'll ask one, one more question because I saw Charles's hand and he was speaking today. So Charles, you get to close and this will be it. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks, uh, Charles Shapiro from Atlanta. Can, there is a trend to give leadership training to everyone. Um, I'm on the board of trustees of a university that's giving leadership training to all first year students. Can, I mean, by definition, can everybody be a leader? Does that make sense? What, what's your response to that? Can everybody be a leader? All this tra leadership training to everyone that you've identified in your book, by the way, also, um, can, can, every, can anyone be a leader? And first year students at the business school or the? No, no, no. Uh, different university. Different university. First year students at a uh, university in Georgia are getting that message. Is it possible? I, I don't think everyone could be a leader, nor do I think everyone wants to be a leader. However, Sometimes people confuse developing good uh, collaborative skills with being a leader. In other words, suppose we're all together in a group, in a team, and you have a point of view you want to get across. Well, in a sense, that requires a kind of leadership, but it's not, you're not going to be leading all these people uh, to other things. You just want to be able to to get across something, and it requires being able to listen to the different points of view, to being able to put together a good argument, and so on. And some people think that's leadership training. Well, in a certain sense it is, but it's not the kind of leadership we're talking about that really is going to transform uh, organizations and solve uh, great problems and bring together people to collaborate in a long, sustainable way. We've learned a couple things today. <laughs> this gentleman does not present leadership BS. Also, um, CEOs, let's see, one, one point you made was not only leadership training can be worthless, but it's also destructive. So we're gonna quit while we're ahead. We'll have one more session and we'll leave some open time for bottom-up discussions. I want to thank Dr. Maccabee, who, uh, by the way, I neglected to say he's also a Swedish knight. It was the commander of the Order of the Polar Star. Congratulations for his work in Sweden. You, you should come back tomorrow and sit with the Swedish ambassador and talk about your command. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you, like 
I have found this a tremendously valuable discussion. Obviously, the questions went on for some time. That's always a good sign. We'll break for about 10 minutes, 15, yeah? Willing to sign books if anything. Yes, we'll break for 10 or 15 minutes so that you can uh, get your copy of Strategic Intelligence, which Dr. McAbee will sign. And I'm grateful that um, despite my distorting all the colleagues' questions, your answers were excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs>